All right, sorry you had to see my behind there as I walk back here to the table, but it's a Saturday morning. Uh, Senator Will Schroeder's down here. I uh, met over at Smoking Pit. Yep. Senator meet the uh, candidates. Yeah, had right a good morning. Then. So he decided uh, this was a good time to come on over here on a Saturday morning for us to sit down, have our conversations with Keith about the uh, race and, and his term in the, uh, in the Senate. 24th District, is that correct? Yep. 20, yep. I, always, I always forget that. For some reason, I won't call Campbell, it 20th District. Bracket. Yeah, we were talking that. That's a very diverse district between it the is. business, uh, larger population area of Campbell County, right. and then Bracken and Pendleton. Yeah, I I honestly think it's one of the most unique districts, probably the most unique in Commonwealth of Kentucky. Because you're right, you have Newport, you have more of the urban area, you have the suburbs, Fort Thomas, Cold Spring, and you get more rural. Um, yeah, Bracken, Pendleton, I mean, you just, it, it really covers everything that you could have in Kentucky. It's all in this district. So when you go to, to Frankfurt to, to do that, you know, cause for, some of the, uh, for some of the senators, representatives of Fayette and Jefferson County, when the discussions are going on about agriculture, it's not directly related to their constituents. Right. So they can kind of be a, um, a part of that discussion, but it's not in their heart. You have to cover almost every single subject that's yeah, down there. Absolutely. Uh, everything everything that comes across the desk, so to speak, is going to impact some of our constituents. I, sure. I was just doing a story um, before you were, you came over on the state looking at 911. Okay. And so if you're looking at 911 service from the urban area up of the Newport, that's one set of issues Right. compared to, okay, now I have to also look at it from a Pendleton Bracken. Yep where the response time is greater and it's a totally different set of issues Absolutely. for us. Absolutely. Yeah. Always I, have to factor that that kind of stuff in. So got to know a lot more than uh, a lot of the other representatives or senators would yeah. know. But well, the trade-off, you know, the trade-off is you get to meet people from all different backgrounds and different areas and that's that's part of what makes the job fun, you know, meeting different people from different counties. And, and we've joked that, um, you know, kind of watching all four Facebook counts and what you're all doing, my goodness, you all eat well during campaign <laughs> seasons because you're always at a restaurant, a festival, a feast or something. Yeah. yeah, so I learned in 2014 when I ran, my wife and I, you know, going door to door thought we were going to lose a bunch of weight, right? <laughs> and we quickly realized that uh, any calories we burn going door to door, we we're just putting back on. And, you know, whether it's ice cream at Howard's Place or, you know, just any of the stops or just picking up fast food at night because you're so busy and, and you know, you got to just keep working on the campaign. So those calories, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I've asked the question since we're still real close. Wouldn't this have been a great week for Wolf Fest instead of 198 degrees last yeah, week? Crazy. What did you eat there? What's your first thing to eat at the Wolf Fest? You know what? I, I had a burger. So we just, the buffalo burger? Yeah. 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 So they were, uh, they were grilling those up, and we, we just went with that. So um, A lot of people like the buffalo burgers. They're good. Yeah. They're good. I think, you know, I think my wife got some uh, slider for my daughter Grace. The meatball was sliders or the No, cider. Apple cider. Oh I have cider. Yeah, okay, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, got some cider. But it was kinda yeah, to your point it was it was so warm that kinda changed the changed the feel a little bit. I um, joked with some fire uh, department um, people over here yesterday if, if this weather would have been last week, I'd have ate another forty dollars worth of food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it was neat. You know what I'll say is, uh, so our daughter, we have a, a two-year-old daughter, Grace, uh, four-month-old son, Trey, and so this this year it was special because she got to ride the pony ride. She got to do all that fun stuff that in the past she was a little too too yeah. little to do. So did you do the wax little, hands? It was pretty. No, I didn't. It, it's down by the creek and okay. the trees, and, okay. and when my kids were that age, two and three, we did the wax hands, and we still have their wax hands okay. from, you know, those, those little bitty hands. That. I'll have to check, we'll have yeah. to check that out. It's, it's right across from uh, where the petting zoo used to be, and the okay. petting zoo was gone this year. Yeah, so well, they kind of had the, I guess, in the tent, you know, yeah. they, they had that, so yeah. that's, that's a highlight for her. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, now, absolutely. Uh, one of the things, we started every one of these out with the opportunity, just tell who is Will Schroeder. Okay, well, I, uh, Will Schroeder, I live in Wilder, Kentucky, right by Northern Kentucky University. I uh, grew up in Northern Kentucky, uh, met my wife in high school, high school sweetheart. We both Which high school? Beachwood. Beachwood, okay. So Fort Mitchell, and we both went to the University of Kentucky together. 
and then decided, uh, we both decided to go to law school, uh, Northern Kentucky University. So went there and that's, uh, moved to Campbell County and um, after graduated law school was a prosecutor in Campbell County. So worked with law enforcement and victims of crime and just working on the heroin epidemic at the time. Um, and then, yeah, in 2014, there was an opportunity to run for the state senate. Public service had always kind of been something I'd been around. My dad had been a judge uh, for 29 years. Federal, state, so county. He was a state judge. He he started out in Kenton County, but then he was on the court of appeals and represented uh, the district that I represent. So he okay. represented. He had 21 counties. Wow. Um, including Campbell, Pendleton, and Bracken. And then he, in 2006, when I was at uh, NKU, Chase College of Law, he ran for Kentucky Supreme Court and was elected. Oh, I didn't so, know that. So, yeah, so he had, it was, it was neat, he had Campbell, Pendleton, and Bracken in his, in his uh, Kentucky Supreme Court district. Oh, cool. So, yeah, so public service, like I said, been around it through him. My mom had been a teacher until she got sick. Um, she what was she a teacher? So she was uh, a few different places, but uh, Bellevue Middle School was one of them. So again, in the mm -hmm. in the district, just kind of yeah. neat. You know, she taught private and uh, public school. Uh, Middle school is a hard age. They're they're literally wanting to be the kid that they've been and wanting to be an adult and and. That's a constant battle. Yeah. Right? That's a special, you know. High school has its thing. Elementary has its thing. Right. But middle school, they have a hard, <laughs> hard job. No doubt. Yeah. No, no doubt. Yeah. So you're right. This, do you all practice? Did you practice law together? Or? Uh, no, we never practiced together. But um, yeah, she is. You know, currently she's she's working part time, but she gets to work from home. She works for a, a dot com company. Okay. Um, and they've been around for a while, but. Uh, so she plays an in-house counsel role with another individual and uh, takes care of her kids and then helps me on the campaign. And Yeah, very supportive spouse. That's, that's one thing. If anyone's watching this thing about running for office, you have to make sure the, the first and most important, <laughs> vote, yes. most important vote you get is that of the spouse. I mean, it's, it's crucial. When I became a girls basketball coach back in the 90s, at the Wolf Fest, my wife buy, bought a sign that hung in our house that said, we interrupt this marriage for basketball season. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the same way you the, you have to have them on board yeah uh, to what the job's going to be or it, it's not good <laughs> yeah. yep absolutely well let's go get hey, get started okay uh, we've started each one of these state uh, interviews off um, and I think it's more of a state and federal issue than it okay. is a local issue the tone of politics is just bad right now it's really bad um, it you know I don't know if I would say it's the worst ever it's probably the worst that a lot of people this generation has ever ever experienced 70s with water K the civil riots issues in the 60s yeah the um, the southern Jim Crow laws and, and McCarthyism in the 50s um, and you know that little time back in the Civil War that was a pretty yeah. bad, bad bad time too so you know we this is not unusual for us as a country um, but we've been able to move out of those times to better times. What do we need to do to be able to move from where we're at now to some better times? Yeah. You know, I think what makes this time so difficult, honestly, I think social media just plays a huge, huge role in that. I mean, I there's people that will say stuff on Facebook that will never say that to me in person, you know. And I'll, I'll see people, and, and they're okay talking. And a lot of times, you know, even... Uh, just people on the opposite part of me, just different philosophical, political philosophies. You know, sometimes on Facebook, it just comes out and it's so divisive. But then you meet these people at a meet the candidates or wherever. You just meet them at in town and you're like, look, we we have a lot in common, right? We both like UK basketball or whatever. Uh, but I just think sometimes on social media, things get amped up to just a whole new level that is not really helping the, the discussion. And just frankly, like, you know, we have to be careful with our rhetoric and we have to think about, you know, think about our kids and how that comes across and, um, how do we change that? We, though? we, you know, I think it, I think it starts with the leadership. Uh, you know, we have to be show, willing to listen to people, um, even though we might not agree with them, let's listen to them and show that we're open to having conversations. People should be at the table and coming up, discussing ideas together. Um, but it can be hard because, you know, there's so many people and anyone can have a Facebook account early and say whatever they want. So, well, or have it an anonymous. Yeah. It doesn't even right. have to be them. 
uh, well, on Twitter. I mean, for me, things. for me as a candidate, what I try to do is, you know, if there's there's nasty comments or whatever, that's fine. Um, it, how how am I going to respond? You know, am I going to respond in a professional manner? And that's what I always strive to do. The the times where it's just too over the top that you know I don't want it on my wall. I've had people even. You know, I've had interns or pages in Frankfurt, and people will make comments about their looks and stuff like that, and that's, you know, just completely inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And so there's a time and place for everything, but certainly, I mean, when you're looking at people's, you know, disparaging comments about people's looks and stuff, and and when they're kids, you know, I mean, that's just completely uncalled for. So. Yeah, and, and Bevin and Trump doesn't help the matter. Uh, when he spoke in Cynthia and I went to cover that press conference, and that was the question I asked him: yeah. Does he regret what he has contributed to that nasty political tone um, just by some comments that you look at him and go, "Golly, I wish hadn't you said that." Right. And uh, heck, in the mornings I wake up and just worry about what tweet I'm going to see President well. Trump send at 4 a.m. Um, it makes it it made it a difficult session because you know we're trying to deal with policy and super important issues. Uh, well, then when you have the rhetoric from both sides, mm -hmm. and it, it really, even if people agree with me on the policy, and then and the governor saying something that's you know just off the wall, uh, you know how how are they even going to hear what I have to say about the policy? Because the focus is all on these this rhetoric. And that's where, you know, we just have to be careful as, you know, elected officials. We just have to be cognizant of what we're saying and the impact it's going to have on people. Yeah. And, you know, to your point, knocking when I'm knocking on doors and talking to voters, a lot of people uh, like like the policy of the president or like the policy of the governor. Um, but to your point, the rhetoric is, you know, they don't like that. Yeah. So, Yeah, I, I've made the, my comment on social media several times is, man, Trump makes it hard <laughs> to be a Trump supporter sometimes with something he'll say and you'll be going, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. Because you do agree with the policies and the way the, 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 way the country is going, but then, you know, it's yeah. just, uh, yeah. Yeah. All you right. Know, and, well, I was just going to say, a, a, a friend of mine said, well, you know, we, we knew when we elected him, that's, that's what kind of person he was. Mm -hmm. And his point was it, it's refreshing because Trump isn't a typical politician to you know, really sanitize, I guess, his his speech, but then on the flip side is you get the more, you know, some of that rhetoric that's just not Yeah. You don't have to helpful. You don't have to wonder what he's thinking. Exactly. Because he's going to tell you <laughs> he's going to tell you I want to hear it or not. Exactly. <laughs> so. Exactly. Well um one of the questions that I've asked all three of the other candidates is what I what I feel is a very historical Supreme Court decision is looming. Um, you know, you go back, I think maybe the last one was Judge Ray Corns and the uh, Supreme Court decision over CARA that created the education. Mm -hmm. um, and this one with the, um, the process of which the um, pension reform bill um, was put into place. Yeah. Um, if they rule on one side, it's going to change things tremendously. If they rule another way, it, it also has effects. So this is a very, very important decision that they have coming. What if they rule against you all? What yeah. if they rule against the Republican Party's process, the way they did it, and they said it is unconstitutional? What do you all? What, what would be your stance at that not time when Supreme Court says you're wrong? Right. So I mean, I respect my dad again, and been on the Kentucky Supreme Court. I respect separation of powers. I respect the court. Um, so we're gonna have to if they if they come back and say, you know that that law is void now because of our finding, then we're gonna, it's back to the drawing board this next session. One thing that I've repeatedly said to voters and constituents is that look, the process was messy. There's no doubt about it. And that and regardless of what the court says, we can do better as far as we need to do a better job with timing and you know having the bills have the readings that that they do under the title that they were given um i think sometimes leadership has been now you know the turnover for the house to be in control by republicans just happened in 2016. so mm -hmm. the senate committee substitute process would have which happened for this pension bill is something that you know gone on for years it's nothing new but this was a bill that everyone was watching mm -hmm. and people forget that 
okay, this is something we're used to doing down in Frankfurt, but what is what is this going to look like to the public? And it looked terrible. From the mm-hmm. title of the bill, oh, you know, the There's no and, other bill. I know. Oh, trust me. Trust me. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, the Senator Joe Bowen, who did the original pension bill, that was his bill, so they decided to use it. Terrible optics, and if... If I were to pull out my phone and go back to that day we voted, I was texting my wife. I said, the optics of this are getting worse and worse. I mean, it was you could have seen it coming from a mile away that that was not a good bill to use <laughs> yeah. as a committee substitute. So regardless of what the Kentucky Supreme Court says, we have to do a better job with that process, just letting people, keeping people informed. Because, you know, when I talk to a lot of voters, they're like, I understand something had to happen, but why would you guys have to use that bill? Mm-hmm. You know, they felt like it was a personal insult. Or Yeah, there's um, a lot of teachers that uh, feel that name of that bill was chosen intentionally as a slight against them yeah. um, because of the way it was. Yeah, you're right. There's a yeah. lot who feel that way. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's what, you know, we have to deal with that. So there's, there's that decision, the three readings decision. And then the big, one of the bigger decisions um, that really hasn't gotten a lot of, a lot of uh, discussion, but um, the circuit judge found, and, and our attorney general, Andy Bashir hadn't actually even made this argument, but he said that it was a revenue bill, that it impacted revenue. Um, and by impacting revenue, that changes. The government can have line item veto over revenue bills, but only revenue bills in Kentucky. So my concern, going back to separation of powers and being in the General Assembly, if we give the governor you know, a much larger tool in the toolbox than he's ever had, regardless of a, if it's this governor or Andy Bashir or whoever comes down, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Democrat or Republican, that's, that's giving them a tool that they've never had in the history of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I think that's dangerous because... Uh, again, they're going to start having the authority to line item uh, veto if it's a revenue bill. And, it, and then it really begs the question, well, what is a revenue bill? You know, appropriations bill. In the past, it's it's a appropriation of money. It's the budget yeah. bill. But in this case, you know, we talked about future hires and how future hires would be, you know, mm-hmm. um, their retirement. But it, in my opinion, that's not an appropriation of money. And so, but by the court, uh, the lower court judge saying it's appropriation of money, that really just changes the dynamic of how you're going to vote on every bill. Is it is it an appropriations revenue bill or is it just a regular bill? Yeah. Do we need, you know, how many votes do we need now? Do we need a supermajority? Does the governor get line out of veto? All those, all those questions are coming up now. Well, and that's why I say I, I feel like this is the, probably the most historical Supreme Court decision as far as long lasting since that care of it. Yeah. Because just what you have said. You mentioned a term in there that I had never heard before, and if you could explain it just a little. Substitution committee? Okay. Uh, so committee substitute. Committee substitute. And so um, what happens is you go into the committee, and for instance with the pension bill, uh, in the final you need three readings in each chamber mm-hmm. for the bill to be heard. And so what happens when you come down to the final days of session, and this happened... It, and again, it wasn't unique to this bill. So this committee has been around for how long? So no, it will be it'll be any committee. So let's okay. say appropriations and revenue, state and local government. It could be any of those committees. Okay. But what you do is call it a committee substitute. Okay. So in this case, they took a bill that was dealing with wastewater and all that, and they substituted it in. They take that out and they substitute in. You vote the sub in uh, language from another bill. And so that's that was been done on like the heroin legislation. The, it's always done on the budget because it takes that long. It takes to the final days for it all to come together. Mm-hmm. So uh, and the reason they have to do that is because each bill needs three readings in each chamber. So when they do a committee substitute, for instance, with the 151 Senate Bill 151, Senate Bill 151 had already had three readings in the Senate and passed out of the Senate. And then it had had three readings in the House, but hadn't been voted on in the House. So when they did a committee substitute, they put in uh, the language from the pension bill into 151, and then vote on that. Okay. So it's a it's a way you know that when you're down to the last seconds or last days of session, that's the process, and that's the committee substitute process that's been around forever. But again, as elected officials, we need to realize like. 
the public doesn't understand this, and is that good public policy? Because when I was elected, 2014, went down there in 2015, and was introduced to that for the first time, I was like, wait a second, this is <laughs> this is kind of, you know, and yeah. you hear, well, this is how it's always done, and then, but regardless, my point is, regardless of what the court says, there's we need to say, is this really good public policy to do it this way? Yeah, and, and if I remember right, when you talk about getting to the last days, there were days after that, but if you didn't pass them in the timeline you did, you couldn't have overridden a governor's veto. Correct. That it had to be done. Yes, there were days for somebody people going, well, there were days after that, but these were the days for you all to come back and override a governor's veto. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's kind of keep on education here okay. for a little bit. Um, the the um, the budget bill come out. There were cuts to education. There were increases to education uh, in some areas. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the uh, complaints are there were more cuts and there were increases. Um, what areas of that budget bill did you have concern in? Were you saying okay, that's okay, or how did all that play out as far as you looking at education? Yeah. So this kind of goes back to our original, I think, conversation in this interview about representing just so uniquely different areas. Fort Thomas Independent School District, for instance, they don't have public transportation. It's a, you know, it's a, mm -hmm. no, the community's pretty tight-knit right there where everyone can either walk to school or they're, you know, dropping kids off. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that's not the case down here, Pendleton County or Bracken County especially, or the southern end of Campbell County. And so one of the things immediately that I noticed when the governor released his budget and the transportation uh, dollars were cut for school districts was this is going to be a problem. How are the school districts going to come up with transfer, these transportation mm -hmm. dollars on their own? So that's you have to go through the process of educating yourself. Okay, the governor's saying maybe they have extra money here. School districts are saying they don't, you know, and trying to just educate yourself talking to the school superintendents and stuff seeing, okay, what can you guys do uh, with the education? Um, so you were in conversation with the superintendents of all the varied, mm -hmm. well, how many school districts right. do you have? About eight, so nine, I, ten? I have about eight, yeah. So yeah. Um, I have more than any other uh, state senator. Really? Yeah. Wow. And when you add up Campbell County and all the independents, mm -hmm. and then, you know, with Pendleton and Bracken, but you just think about Campbell County, Newport, Bellevue, Dayton, Silver Grove, Fort Thomas, <laughs> yeah. so then Pendleton yeah. Bracken, and then you add, you know, we have uh, Augusta. Don't yeah, forget Augusta, Augusta over in Bracken. Bracken. Absolutely. So, yeah. so you, you um, you're in and then, and then yeah. So I yeah I met with uh, not just about that, but about pensions, and so I met with the superintendents, and I talked to the superintendents often. Anthony Strong, when he was superintendent, would text. Uh, myself and Representative Parr pretty often, um, and you know, not not even like on budget stuff, just whether it's some other bill. There's so many bills that it's like, well, hey, have we really reached out to the superintendents? Is this this sounds good on paper, but how's it going to play out in the real world? And that's what I not just with education, but with any bill that I'm always trying to do because. You know, you can try to be an expert in everything, but that doesn't mean that in the real world you've had experience yeah. in that. So that's where, um, you know, there's there's superintendents that have just been great. Uh, Anthony was good. Jay Brewer in Dayton is another one that, you know, I know I can always text him and, and get feedback. And he'll say, okay, well, here's, here's how that really plays out. You know, here's how that plays out in uh, everyday school. Uh, but going back to the you know original question, and uh, at the end of the day, we you know a lot of the the programs and stuff that have been cut, we were able to restore, and then on for cut out of the governor's budget, correct? Because there were yeah. still cuts made out of the final budget. There were still cuts made, yeah, yeah definitely. And then, um, but you know, like seek dollars, for instance, that's the the highest per dollar that it's ever been seek. Uh, the formula, the amount the students get in the seat formula. Now, is it high enough? People will say, well, with inflation, it takes us back to 2008. So, yeah, of course, it's not high enough. We, we'd like it to be higher, too, but that's that's the budget, right? It's a, it's a pie. It's a piece of the pie, and everything's in slices. And if you want more, you know, you want more transportation dollars here, making that slice bigger, then what does that make something else smaller slice? And so we're just trying to constantly, and the, 
the number the solution to that is grow the pie, right? Grow revenue. And that's what we've been trying to do with attracting businesses. Yeah, and we'll, we'll have a good conversation here in a little bit on that okay. one. Um, that, because that is probably, I, I made comment in some of the other videos, might be the number one question I have here. Even though I'm a retired school teacher concerned about education and pension, the revenue generation might be the most important uh, issue in this race yeah. as we look for the next few years. Um, as far as education, is there anything that you look at and say, this session we need to look at changing this anything that um you think may come up in this set this coming session that that needs to be addressed yeah so it's a it's gonna be a short session and the difficulty of the short session is people try to cram everything in do a short session uh that they can so it's like you know let's try to cram 60 days into 30. so uh the good thing about the interim committee meetings is we start looking at Okay, what uh, what should we prepare for and look down? I think the conversation of school safety, there's a committee that's meeting as a special um, joint com committee put together. Uh, my colleague Max Wise is leading that. Just talking about school safety, what can we do? Um, you know, obviously school, school resource officers, what other precautions can we take to make our schools safer? That's that's going to be an ongoing discussion. And of course that's been a big issue out here in Pendleton County. Right. Um, after the Florida shooting, Dr. Strong, who you, you mentioned, um, found it in the budget to have two school resource officers for the remainder of the year and then the sheriff, fiscal court, and school district came together to find a way to fund it to continue that for mm -hmm. one more year. Yeah. Um, looking at, with an eye on the future of how we're going to fund that in the future. So. They'll probably be wanting to see right. what you all do to see if it uh, can help that out in any regard. Yeah. Well, the next question is, is the one I just mentioned, and it simply says, where should Kentucky's funding come from? Yes. Yeah, so how, how should Kentucky generate its revenue? So my philosophy is we attract businesses, the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Those businesses lead to more jobs. Those more jobs lead to more people working, more people on the payroll that are paying taxes, and they help grow the general fund. And we've seen that uh, with the policies. And you know, again, I, as a state senator, I'm not creating the jobs, but what I, and I get that 100%, you know, the entrepreneurs are the ones creating the jobs, but what we can do as elected officials is help create an environment where jobs companies are welcome. And uh, 2017, we set an economic development record, we being the Commonwealth of Kentucky, at $9.2 billion, so that means companies saying, hey, I'm going to relocate to Kentucky or I'm going to start up in Kentucky and this is how much money I'm bringing. Or you're having companies like Toyota say, okay, we're going to do an expansion instead of going uh, somewhere else, we're going to do it right here in Georgetown. And that's good again because it means they're, they're anchored in here, but more people, mm -hmm. more opportunities. And again, the more people that are working, the better off we are. And so that's, I think, a big distinction between my opponent and myself. You know, my opponent has said in her commercial, for instance, that she thinks we need to have out-of-state corporations pay their fair share. And when I asked her about that at NKU, because I said it means raising taxes, and she said, I never said that, just their fair share. So I would beg, you know, the question is, well, what's their fair share? They're not, I, don't, I assume she's not saying lower. So the idea that we can tax out-of-state corporations at a higher rate is a dangerous idea because we're in constant competition with other states. 49 other states want that business. And, and really, at this point, it's, you know, the idea of the world is flat idea that we're in competition with, you know, China, India, everywhere else, too. That companies can, if they don't, even if it's not the other 49 states, they might say, hey, I'm going to move my company overseas. Yeah. And so how are we going to compete? You know, how are we going to make sure that Toyota stays in Kentucky? How are we... You know, DHL, Amazon, all these, you know, in Northern Kentucky, Boone County especially is doing great. But we have to continue to let them know they're welcome here. Now, we don't give away the farm, but we have to say, hey, you're welcome here, and we're going to make this a good environment to do business in. I think we saw that in the last presidential election when it was a carrier air conditioning um, in Indiana was relocated to Mexico, and they yeah. become... Um, Almost like a, a, um, a campaign image of, of right. trying to save jobs. Right. Um, and Indiana is not much different than Kentucky as far as environments. Um, and we don't want those Amazons or wherever to ship off to somewhere else. Right. 
and, and lose all this. So are you still, because uh, I know the Republican Party in the last election had had conversations about moving to a consumption base from an income. Um, you all did that with what, 17 different services? Was it 17 different services? I think so. Um, where, where do you stand on that? Do you see Republicans regaining control, or not regaining, but continuing to have control? Do you see that moving more to consumption base? Or? So, you know, you just mentioned Indiana. And one of the things that we do is look at the surrounding states, not just surrounding, but especially the surrounding, maybe a little bit more focused on the surrounding states, and see how they're doing and what are they doing right. And when you look at Tennessee and the model that they have gone mm -hmm. with, it's you know almost essentially no income tax, um, but sales tax, everything's done through sales tax. And then Indiana has been going that route as well. When you look nationally, sales tax receipts um, has on just goods, just the purchase of goods, have really declined. Uh, they're just not what they used to be. So the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the last time they had fundamental tax reform was before I was around. I'm 36 years old. <laughs> and it was before I was even born, right? So the time, I mean, I ran in 2014. Uh, we need to start having this conversation. So I think it's a, it's a first step. Now, before we take another step, I do think we need to, okay, how is what we're doing um, working? Are we, you know, is this working? If it's working, we can keep going down that path. Now, what I like to remind people that a lot of people will say, oh, I didn't even know that. I would receive emails from people in Pendleton County, for instance. They'd say, oh, I never even heard that. So we, we did expand the sales tax to services, but we also lowered the income. Yes. So you got a reduction in income tax, the idea being, you know, you have that decision to make you more money in your pocket from your paycheck, and then you decide, okay, am, am I going to go golfing and pay the golf fees or, you know, dry cleaning? You know, I during session especially, I, uh, you know, get my shirts dry cleaned just because it's easier. Uh, but that tax is something I'm willing to pay, you know. Mm -hmm. So everyone agrees we need more revenue. No one agrees 100% <laughs> how, how we go about doing it. Everybody agrees, let somebody else to pay it for it. Yeah, <laughs> but nobody wants to right, take it up. Right. That's the one thing. Don't raise right. my taxes, raise everybody else's. Right, yeah. exactly. So, um, yeah, you know, we're going to have to see how it's working. Now, that, that did generate some revenue. Um, is it enough to solve all the problems? No, not at all. Now, there's other revenue, um, you know, options that people have talked about. I don't know if you're going to bring those up. I'm happy to. No, go ahead. Them. Well, you know, I just set the record straight, I guess, as far as casino gaming and, and medical marijuana. Those are two issues that when constituents come into my office, they, they want to talk about. And a lot of people have this idea that, they're silver bullets for our revenue problem, mm -hmm. and they're just not. Mm -hmm. So what I what I like to say is, okay, let's put the you know morality on these issues aside for a second. If you're telling me it's a revenue solution, let's just let's just consider the revenue. And when it comes to casino gaming, you have states like uh, you take out Nevada because they're really the outlier with Vegas. Yeah. You know, they were early into the game and they're always going to be there. But when you look at uh, other states that have tried casino gaming, it just has not added to their general fund. It, on on average, it's uh, about two to two point five percent. The Rockefeller Institute did a study, and that's you know across a good period of time. So that was when in prosperous years. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to look far. I mean, when we look across the river in Cincinnati, and you talk to Republicans or Democrat council members in Hamilton County or Cincinnati, um, they'll tell you, look, our projections are nowhere near what they promised us. So the idea that, you know, we can just have casino gaming all of a sudden and, and it solve the, the pension crisis or anything else is, is just not true. Uh, now, You know, I became a voter when the lottery came in. Okay. And that was going to solve all of our funding education. for education. Right. So did it do right. that? Right. <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. So, so then the other uh, common, you know, I guess solution that I hear is uh, medical ma marijuana. And so the first thing I always like to say is, well, you know, we don't, and the Commonwealth of Kentucky tax any other medicine, but you're going to tell me that we should tax marijuana. And, and I lost both my parents to cancer, so that conversation of, you know, should we have it as medicine or not, it's a conversation I'm open to having. But again, just talking about the revenue, it's not there. So 
when you look at uh, Colorado, and Colorado has, obviously, they've gone farther. Mm -hmm. They've done recreational yes. marijuana. Now, when you add all the taxes, uh, they have a lot of taxes on it, and it goes to, you know, like prevention, uh, all these different things. So the money that actually goes back into the Colorado General Fund is 5% of that tax. Now, that 5% makes up 0.1% of their general budget. Wow. And it's, so I mean. So it's not having the financial. It's not. It's not. To I the mean, general fund. It's just not. It's yeah. not. So again, like if you want to have that debate with me about is it a medicine or not, I think that's a valid debate. But coming in and saying, hey, this is going to solve our problem. You need to do this. Well, A, is it really a medicine? Because we don't tax medicine. So if, if it's valid that a you know, cancer patient needs marijuana, is it fair to tax that cancer patient? When you don't tax any other yeah, patients. Yeah, when you don't tax anything else. Yeah. And then second of all, I mean, look at all the other states that have gone that route and it's just their revenue has not, it just hasn't helped. Okay. A couple, actually three different questions that come out of that. To, to be clear on the medical marijuana issue, you're not for medical marijuana as a generator of revenue but you're still open-minded or haven't made a position on whether it should be legal for cancer patients? So I'm open-minded to listening to the medical community, but the, the problem uh, that I see for us in the Commonwealth of Kentucky right now is at the federal level, it's still a Schedule I drug, mm -hmm. um, Schedule I controlled substance. And what I think Congressman Massey and other um, federal, you know, the federal delegation have said is, Let's take it off the scheduling so it can be studied more, and let's give the states the authority to make that decision for themselves, which I, which I agree with 100%. I think the danger right now when it's federally classified as a Schedule I, um, and then us going ahead and making a decision, and I realize some other states have done it, but it becomes really tricky, for instance, with Colorado and the, the banking and banks trying to comply with federal laws so they can't take any money from businesses dealing with marijuana, um, you know, as if, a, if a farmer in Kentucky starts growing marijuana uh, and they're also growing other crops that have any kind of federal connection, like, it gets risky. And that's what I think that really the decision needs to be made at the federal level to take it off of schedule, schedule one controlled substance and give the states the authority to start looking at it. Gotcha. Okay. Um, golly, I forgot the other two. Oh, oh I know the, well, the other questions. Um, on a consumption-based tax, so you had talked about we don't tax medicine now. One mm -hmm. of the questions that have come up from the uh, um, the other side of the aisle is that the consumption base would uh, all of a sudden start going on medicine too. Do you what do you feel about um, if you're getting rid of it, uh, lowering income taxes to the point maybe it's zero, mm -hmm. um, and raising consumption base? Do we? kind of do what we do now with sales tax and exclude medicine and food, basic food right. and those kind of things out Right. There. Yeah, I think there's always going to be that, you know, exclusions for uh, maybe it's a certain level or what, but the idea of taxing medicine, I mean, that doesn't really sit well with me. I mean, people are sick and then we're taxing them and they got sick. I mean, that's just, it just seems really unfair and not, you know. Yeah. I mean, we're not, I don't know, good stewards or good, you know. Help. We're just not helping people. We, yeah, I, I just so that that sits uneasy with me. I don't like that idea. And food to the same extent. I mean, I get you know fast food or convenience. That's that's one thing. But like milk and bread. I mean, that's that's something I think would be hard yeah. to go down that road. So you um, just like their exclusion from the sales tax now. You see that con continuing. I did all sort of things. And again, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's. Uh, you know, different states have done it differently. So maybe it's a certain income level or, you know, how we do it. But, um, yeah, I think that conversation would be, it wouldn't be a rash decision by any means when that's, that's decided. Um, you know, saying the other side of the aisle, the other side of the aisle and my opponent endorsed this House Bill 29. House Bill 29 last year, uh, Representative Wayne um, out of, Jim Wayne out of Louisville area, uh, came up with a bill to generate revenue, and it generated it over half a billion dollars. And it had, um, I think, 10 services, many of the same services that were uh, in our revenue bill that were taxed, but it didn't, you know, it didn't reduce the income like we reduced the income. 
So, you know, I find it a little hypocritical, more than a little hypocritical to say, hey, you know, he voted for this, but she has endorsed uh, House Bill 29, which would have raised taxes by over half a million dollars. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, the one you mentioned, other states, you mentioned Tennessee is a positive. The other side of the aisle counters with Kansas that tried to go more to a consumption base and did not work for them. What's the difference between what, what your party is wanting to do in Kentucky and the failures of Kansas? So I think Kansas wasn't necessarily just consumption based. I think what Kansas did was they slashed. Uh, business, you know, corp the corporate tax so much uh, with the idea that all this, all the companies would just flood into the area, um, and then it didn't happen. So they really slashed. Instead of, you know, when we lowered the income tax and we lowered corporate tax, but we're, we're taking steps. You know, it's more baby steps, and to see how it, how it's going to impact um, our revenue in general. And Kansas took a pretty drastic cut. They just said, hey, we're going to. This is our idea. We're going to attract new businesses if we make this a very good environment. So, mm -hmm. not necessarily a bad idea, but Kansas is in a different position than us in the sense we geographically, Kentucky, great, great position. Now, you know, the arc, people say, how did they pick, you know, this Williamstown, Kentucky, or right around there to uh, build this arc? And it's because uh, I think it's three fourths of the United States, or maybe it's two thirds can get there within 24 hours. Kentucky Speedway the same way. Yeah. When they were looking at that, it was millions upon millions upon millions right. of people who were within, a, like a, a, and I don't remember the numbers, but I remember reading an article that a NASCAR fan will drive nine hours. To yeah. Get, and there, I mean, it was unbelievable the amount of people that lived within nine hours right. Right. of Carrollton, Kentucky. Carrollton, Kentucky, the center of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so Kentucky, unlike Kansas, is geographically we're we're set, you know, as mm -hmm. far as what our location. So when you're doing logistics, shipping, you know, anything, Kentucky's a great place for that. And a lot of companies want to have Kentucky be have a present presence in Kentucky because they can shoot out to you know two thirds uh, of the U.S. and get there within 24 hours. So we're in a great position to continue to attract businesses that way. Our utilities are at a uh, very low compared to uh, other states throughout the U.S., and that's another thing that uh, we're fortunate to have and to attract companies. Um, and then just our modes of transportation with the, the rivers um, being there, that helps too as far as shipping and um, stuff coming on barges and everything else. And your point's probably um, you know made by DHL and Amazon up here in northern Kentucky, UPS and Louisville. Um, that how they've chosen to have Kentucky right. as one of their hubs. Right, absolutely, and that, that brings up another great point is that you have uh, Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky Airport, CVG in Boone County, you have uh, Jefferson County, that creates a lot of the airport down in Louisville, creates a lot of the UPS and all, all those shipping distributions that create a lot of jobs. Yeah, and a lot of jobs creates a lot of taxes, a lot of revenue for you to do other things, exactly. and so you want to keep them here. Absolutely. Okay. Um, one of the side questions, and this is the one question that, that is a personal Fama Falco okay. question. Uh, there's been a switching of um, public notices and where the requirements are for them to go. Yeah. Um, I think you all passed a, a bill this year that allowed some leeway for school, school districts and other ones just to publish them online. Totally understand the transition to yeah. digital. Um, I'm not sure if we're ready to go strictly digital. My parents don't have a cell phone, don't have a smartphone, no laptop, no right. internet. Right. If there's a, a house that, that's going to be sold on the commissioner steps here at the courthouse mm -hmm. steps, and it's a digital, they would never hear about it, any right. of the things. Where do you stand on that transition and, and, and making sure that all of our, you know, in two generations we're probably going to be to a point that you can make those things on online. Right. Not sure we're there yet. So this is something I've looked at in the last two sessions, and it does save, you know, not just the school districts now, uh, they had been exempt in prior budgets, but starting to look at how much would this save, you know, how much would this save the city of Falmouth. Um, and I think we've found a good compromise, and that compromise is that you still have to publish where they can access the information. So for instance, 
uh, Pendleton County School District says, okay, instead of publishing all our budget in the Found with Outlook, we are going to publish it on our own website, but they still would have to publish with the Outlook, okay, to access this information, uh, you have to put it here, and um, talking to superintendents, when I talked to the superintendents group, they said, look, we we'd be willing to mail it out if you, for instance, your parents called and said, hey, I want to see a budget of Pendleton County uh, School District. The school district would be willing to mail them uh, a whole copy because it's still cheaper than taking on pages of, you know, publication. Yeah. So reaching that compromise where you still have to have a notice in the paper that says where you can access that information, uh, I think is a pretty good fair compromise. Okay. All right. Um, going on, um, you know, we talked about before we uh, started, uh, you and Mark Hart are, are in similar situations. You're, you finished your first term and where you were the, uh, the, uh, the change and the hope candidate before, now you have a record. Not a police record, a voting record. <laughs> and so you, for clarity. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, yeah. I had somebody in here earlier. Uh, it was Billy Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> and he made a comment about the stripper room, and I stopped and I went, tobacco stripper room, right? And he yeah. goes, yeah, about that stripper room. Yeah. I said, let's clarify that. One. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, um, a couple of the votes that, that are controversial, yeah. to, to use a term, um, just to kind of walk through the mindset on those. Okay. The first session, right to work. Okay. The um, other side says that's an anti-union vote. Yeah. Walk us through that step well, the process. My first response, you know, I haven't seen that union memberships down. In fact, I would say KA's memberships probably up, you know, with everything they've done. But what we were seeing was that... But KA wouldn't be affected by your bill because you don't have to join. You don't KA. have to join the KA. So it, that bill would not have affected KA because, right. I mean, I chose to be a member of KA the whole time, but, but yeah, I was not required. To the point that union yeah. membership across the states yeah. now was my point. But... Uh, you know, what we were seeing on, in site selections when, when uh, these companies were looking at different states to uh, locate to, that right to work was playing a big big part of that. And they weren't even considering uh, Commonwealth of Kentucky because it you know, hadn't gone that way yet. So unions have played a, you know, a historic and important role in our society in getting you know, workers the rights they need and, and helping the middle class. Um, so they have a they have a great role, I think, but should an individual be forced to join the union because of the job, and that's that's kind of the question, you know, do you, should you have to join this union? Uh, so at the end of the day, you know, I think it was a I think it was a fair bill, um, and then we saw the economic development really take off after that. So you know, I feel so, like the, so did that nine billion come after it, came after it was enacted? Twenty seventeen. Yeah. Okay. So we, you know, the record the record was set immediately after, essentially. So okay. yeah, um, uh, we talked. We've already talked about the uh, the pension bill, so we won't talk about that one. The big one, the other big one, is the charter school school vote. Okay. Um, a lot of uh, teachers upset feel that's a slam or an attack on public schools. Yeah. And so just walk us through that process of, of charter schools. So I was actually one of only four Republicans in the Senate to vote against that charter school. Oh, you voted against charter schools. Against okay. Charter schools. Yeah. To me, that was a bill that um, a lot of the people that wanted charter schools didn't even like that bill. Uh, so I felt like. The constituents I heard from didn't like it because they were worried how it was going to impact public education, or the charter, uh, the smaller group that wanted charter schools didn't really even like that bill. They felt like it wasn't going to get them what they needed. So I just it didn't really feel like it was meeting anyone's needs. Mm -hmm. um, so I voted against that bill. A lot of people have forgotten that, uh, but yeah, I voted against that bill. But the thing that I remind people, you know, we I think we both want. Whether you're, whether you're for charter schools or against charter schools, you want the same thing. You want a good education for kids. And in Campbell County especially, I mean, Fort Thomas Independent is one of the top three school districts in the state. Yeah, you can drive 10 minutes away and be in one of the lowest performing school districts in the state. And that, you know, it's just, that's tough. That's tough as, as a state senator looking at all the school districts and you think, Gosh, if you're a parent, you want what's best for your kid. You want them to be in a great performing school district. So I think, again, we have to sit down. This goes back to sitting down and talking. And when we sit down and talk, we realize 
people want the same thing. They want good performing school districts. It's the idea, how do we get there? That's where, you know, we're going to disagree and maybe we can come up with a, a middle ground. And, and I don't want to get a sidetrack, but as a former teacher, um, and, and with the, the, the different school districts that you're talking about there, and you talked about parents, it's not the teachers or the school district that is the difference between those school districts. It's the parents. The Fort Thomas parents are going to demand that their kid is coming home, doing their work, is learning, is going to take them places to further their education. They're not getting that in the other one. The, the, the emphasis on education at home is not the same. The, the abilities of the teachers, the teaching abilities, the resources they have are a lot of times are very, very similar. And I made the argument before, you can take some of the teachers that are in those low performing school districts and they're better teachers than Fort Thomas Highlands. Because I could go into a school room in, in Fort Thomas Highlands and I have 22 motivated students and motivated parents supporting me mm -hmm. to teach those kids. Right. I walk over, like you said, three miles away and I walk into a classroom and I have zero motivated students. And this is from a teacher who chose to spend eight years in alternative school mm -hmm. because those are the kids who needed me, right. I felt like. Um, but it, they're yeah. doing a better job, but their scores are not nearly at the same level, but they're actually doing a better job. Right. No, you bring up a great point. I'm glad you brought this up. Yeah, it's, the teachers are doing great. It's not the teachers, but even the resources. I mean, you mentioned their home environment. That That's huge factor mm -hmm. obviously but uh, really just the you know the tax revenue base and what, what kind of tools do you have to work with and mm -hmm. all that plays a factor so yeah yeah absolutely um, and what, what about bills you've sponsored have you have you been involved in sponsoring any bills anything that you passed that I have, have benefited I have. our I district have. you know what one bill that I'm really proud of I like telling the story of because it's really just a neat story of kind of American democracy. So in, in 2014, I was knocking on doors. I knocked on a lady's door, kind of gave my pitch. Was, you know, the only prosecutor, I was concerned about the heroin epidemic. I talked about other things. And she said, you know, that's great. I'm not really worried about any of those. She said, what I'm worried about is I have two special needs sons and we can't put a bank account aside for them and have over $2,000 worth of savings in their bank account because if we do, they're going to start losing their, their benefits. 